Now, the good thing is those things don't take too long. Yeah, they're not too bad. Yeah, GrimCon is tomorrow. We're doing, uh, what are we doing? Windows internals. You need a Flare VM to do it. And to make a Flare VM, it always takes forever in the day. Is there a website for GrimCon? Um, I'm sure it's just GrimCon. Yeah. Totally free, open to everybody. Totally free. Oh, here's the site. Awesome. Grimcon uh, 0x4. I'm in the right place in Discord. Cool, cool. Have this up in case anybody says anything. Put up my chat. All right. Let's get rolling since it's 2.16. Welcome to module number eight. After this, we will be halfway across the entire semester. This is entirely real. But hey, we use it for our finances. So this module covers some wireless stuff, starting with everything that is near to you, personal area networks, like Bluetooth. Uh, it has been around for quite a number of years. It is not at all, uh, just because it's short distance doesn't mean it is invulnerable to attacks. Um, the, the big thing about Security Plus and uh, Bluetooth is that it will ask you uh, the distance of each version, uh, how far they can reach, as well as the speeds of each version as it relates. Uh, and also the two big attacks that uh, go with it, uh, blue jacking and blue snarfing. Blue jacking is uh, sending unsolicited messages to a Bluetooth enabled device. And blue snarfing is accessing unauthorized information via Bluetooth. So of the two, blue jacking is really more of an annoyance, like an ad. Whereas blue snarfing is the actual attempt to take information out of a device. NFC is also mentioned in Security Plus. NFC is the one that works within four centimeters of the, the device, allows data to be read or written. NFC is highly prevalent in contactless payment, like Apple Pay and Google Pay and whatnot. 
just like all the other texts, it is not just because four centimeters is really, really small, doesn't mean that it's not impossible to steal information. With a strong enough antenna, you can perform a man in the middle attack or eavesdropping. Uh, attackers can bump into uh, devices and read their information. If NFC is on, they can, you know, in like a big crowd, be able to accidentally bump somebody and see if they can extract data off of them. RFID is also another short range wireless technology. We use it in things like badges, inventory tags, book labels, and other paper-based tags. Uh, like NFC, well, some NFC stuff that doesn't have its own power, RFID also relies on the device connecting to it to provide it power in order to read or write, has a limited amount of storage. But nonetheless, because it does save information and it is used in things like employee ID badges, it is possible to put enough power to it to read its contents and clone the card. There are a number of devices that you can buy that can easily clone any badges and be able to replicate and, and use. All you have to do is just get close enough. Of course, speaking of wireless, we can't ignore Wi-Fi. Again, the test will ask you some of this stuff. So it's good to have a, and be being able to remember some of this. Regarding attacks, there are uh, quite a number since this technology is everywhere. See before a network has wireless on it, it is very easy to see where the boundaries of a network lie. Because if it's not connected into the cable, it's not accessible. Very plain and simple. Without Wi-Fi, you easily know where the where the network ends. With Wi-Fi, that changes. With Wi-Fi, the end is blurry because the network goes beyond the walls of a building, of a home. You know, it, it extends beyond to not only allow the authorized users, but also the unauthorized access. There are several ways to attack wireless, all of them successful in their own unique ways. For example, there's the rogue access point, an unauthorized AP allows anyone to bypass any network security and opens the networks and its users to attacks. Usually in a business environment, these are set up by employees or an insider who wants to bring their personal device in without connecting to the, a network that's already set up. They don't like the configuration, but they realize, oh, if I go to um, Staples, I can get a little access point, stick it on my desk, and now I can connect my phone. That also can open up a door to your entire network infrastructure. The evil twin is another. Evil twins are set up by attackers to mimic an authorized access point to trick wireless devices to unknowingly connect to it instead. Part of the Wi-Fi standard says that if the device's radio is on, it will shoot out beacons. Beacons looking for the access point that it knows. That is just part of its characteristics, just like with eyes you see. So when you walk out with your phone or your laptop outside the range of a Wi-Fi that that device knows and the, and the radio signal is on, it will continuously 
ask, hey, home network or hey, work network, are you there? Even though it's not getting a response because it's outside the range, it will continually ask. There are devices such as the Wi-Fi pineapple who can pick those up and then say, oh, I am that network and trick the, the device, either phone, laptop or whatever, to connect to it. That's an evil twin. It is totally possible. Even if you have a, uh, a strong password because it saw the SSID matching the one that was being beaconed by the device, they just connect. And again, that's just part of the standard. Since wireless networks are using the air as its medium, it means anybody can access the radio waves sent by those devices. Uh, the current way to protect any eavesdropping is encrypted, but that's broken and I'll mention that in a bit. Um, there is also wireless replay as part of Evil Twin, for example, a victim could be connected to the wrong access points and then a session could be hijacked later. Since this is all happening wirelessly, you may not know when it's actually happening. Because when's the last time you checked outside to see who's connected to your access point or what car might be uh, trying to intercept your traffic? Now, wireless security, because it's, as you have seen in the last eight weeks, security is really a, a just big cat and mouse game. First introduced was WEP, wireless, Wired Equivalent Privacy. It was one of the earliest forms to secure wireless traffic, deemed completely unsafe and should never be used. The shared secrets from it are 64 bits in length and it uses an IV uh, of 24 bits. Because of the small size, it's very easy to figure out the pattern and decrypt the message. It worked for a while, but when people figured out that they could use any device to compute uh, the, oh, I'm forgetting off the top of my head what IV stands for. Used to know this like the back of my hand. Oh, initialization vector. The number used to initialize communications with the rest of the infrastructure. Ha ha. There you go. Uh, WPS came out in 2007 to try to make security convenient. And um, that went as well as it sounds. So the idea was if you push a button on the device and then you push a button on the access point, they would connect together without you having to enter anything. No, no pin, no password. They, the two figure it out together. The thing is with WPS, there's no lockout limit for entering. So it's possible to break it by brute force. It also uses pins and it is completely possible to do that brute force against uh, four characters and three character pins. So it only takes 11,000 combinations to get it right. If an attacker can do, let's say uh, 1.3 pins a second, in about four hours, they'll have whatever pin it is. It's also a MAC address filtering, but that's not foolproof. Anybody can spoof a MAC address. There is this option that's talked about, disabling the SSID broadcast in order to hide the network. 
but it really just means that instead of the access point being the one sending out the beacons, it's now all the other devices who do it instead. So you have more noise instead of less noise by disabling SSID broadcast. And also not every, uh, not every access point can turn off their SSID broadcast. So if you think by doing that, you're hiding yourself, nah, not so much. Well, those ideas didn't so didn't work so well. So the Wi-Fi Alliance created WPA. Oh, this is Wi-Fi Protector 2, but uh, WPA came about for personal, um, you know, like small business and enterprise came up for larger implementations. WPA, both one and two, use the temporal key integrity protocol or KTIP. This preserved web's functionality by adding an additional layer to it. So for example, key lengths were raised to 128 bits. The initialization vector was 48 bits to eliminate collisions. They use a, a unique base key, which was created for each wireless device with client devices forming their own keys derived in the authentication process. WPA also included the message integrity check to prevent active or passive man in the middle attacks. It was also initially built with WEP in mind. So kind of backwards compatible with pre-shared keys Well, WPA didn't last long because WPA2 came about in order to improve on WPA. WPA2 uses AES CCMP or the Advanced Encryption Standard counter mode with Cypher blockchaining message authentication code protocol. That's a mouthful. In essence, a 128 bit key is used in four stages to make up one of 10 rounds, followed by a cipher that provides data privacy to most of the header and the payload, since TKIP only protected the source and destination addresses. Authentication for enterprise level is done with the 802.1x standard. If you've ever been on Cabrillo's campus and tried to connect, that is part of the standard used. Uh, this standard applied to wired network would block all traffic on a port by port basis until the client is authenticated and identity is verified. This can also use digital certificates. And in order to secure 801, uh, 802.1x, uh, they brought in extensible authentication protocol as a framework for the authenticating protocols. So you'll see EAP and protected EAP or PEAP uh, for Windows deployments. Uh, but it's not always, you know, it doesn't always work. You have additional things like captive portals that you see at hotels. And like I said, you see captive portals at Cabrillo. Uh, or even Starbucks, when you, you try to connect and it says you have to, you know, you have to authenticate yourself before you can get on the internet. One way that you could protect yourself is minimizing the power level. The power level has nothing to do with your bandwidth. So it is totally okay to reduce the power of your access point, therefore reducing the, the distance your signal will travel while still retaining your bandwidth. That way you could have, let's say your access point at home, not at 100% to where your wireless signal travels beyond your house, beyond the border of your property and into the street and beyond, and instead is more, uh, is more minimal. 
And again, reducing power does not reduce bandwidth. It just limits the length, the, the, you know, the radius of your wireless signal. And that's good because you don't want it reaching out into the, um, you, know, you don't want it reaching out to the street where anybody could listen. Now, for the longest, we thought, oh, WPA2 will be good. Uh, it's, it can't be broken. And then these two came about, the crack and Krug vulnerabilities. Until WPA3 makes it on the market everywhere, anything with WPA2 is breakable by these two. In the, in the uh, module, I've put uh, links to those two. Here's the crook and crack. Uh-oh, not available anymore. Uh, the key reinstallation attack, right, so crack is. They're made compatible with Python 3. You can run this on a network that, I should say you run this on a network that you uh, know, but this, this will break WPA2 successfully. Yeah, here's the main link. You can read about it. This came out in 2017 since then uh, there it's yes, there have been some patches on devices that are being managed. Uh, but you know, but most devices, it pretty much just uh, it's vulnerable. Right now, the way out is WPA3. So take a read. Play with the stuff if you want. Uh, but welcome to wireless, where things aren't as secure as you initially thought. Now let that video process. And then I'll open this. Boop, boop. Give that a short minute. Okay, if I can stick this here. Okay, hopefully that'll finish in a bit. Okay, so this week's work is going to try hack me and knocking out some rooms that relate to wireless. Now I understand that try hack me brings uh, rooms up and down all the time. So these links may not work anymore. These try hack me ones. If not, that's perfectly fine. Just search in the, in the rooms for some Wi-Fi related ones. You knock those out and then show proof that you completed it. Piece of cake. The other link that, uh, I'll, that I put here for your knowledge, is Wiggle. Wiggle is a website where everybody who does war driving, where they drive around and record what, uh, what access points are found in an area. Uh, here, it, it, uh, it's just one big database of all access points found. So I'm moving down towards Cabrillo as an example. 
you can see, you type in your address and see if an access, if your access point, your network is found on this list. If so, it means that it is known to all, like I just zoomed in on this area and look at all these that were found. So award drivers passed by, saw all these networks, they uploaded it to the uh, to this site. And now anybody knows that, hey, if I want to launch an attack, let's say, I could use the key reinstallation attack on any one of these, get myself in, launch the attack and drive off. Because who's going to know? Who's going to... Who's going to see a odd car drive there, stop for about five, 10 or so minutes and then take off. Uh, so this, this is always one of those great sites to show. Take a look, see if your network is on this list. And if so, there is a process to get it off, which I would suggest if it is found uh, on this server. Besides that, I've given you the links uh, to read up on stuff, not really expecting any documentation that, that you read it, but that's more for your own edification. So the real work is knocking out some tri hackney rooms that are in the realm of Wi-Fi hacking. And again, if these are no longer available, perfectly fine. Just search for another one. They have tons of rooms. And uh, check out Wiggle. Any questions? Okay, well, seeing none, I'll stop the 